I am a monk of St. Anselm Abbey. I came to Manchester to join the monastery in 1991. I've worked at the college since 2001. And since 2013, I've been the Vice President for Academic Affairs. It is my pleasure uh, this afternoon to welcome you to today's webinar, Children's Experience of Loss and Grief During the Pandemic, presented by Dr. Patty Cronin-Favaza and Dr. Paul Finn. The college is committed to keeping our alumni and friends engaged by offering webinars, podcasts, and social media challenges. Uh, you may see uh, the, the virtual jigsaw is a particular favorite of mine. Uh, the variety of programs offered so far uh, has been considerable, and I encourage you to contact the alumni office to make suggestions for other events uh, coming up. Today's webinar is being recorded live and will be posted on the college's website for those who can't make it uh, to the live event today. Our presenters will speak for about 25 minutes or so, and then they will take questions. Uh, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you may ask questions throughout the live cast, including when the uh, participants or the, the panelists are speaking, but I will be reading out the questions after the speaking portion has finished. I'd like to introduce our two presenters. Dr. Patty cronin Favaza is an accomplished professor, researcher, and author in the field of early childhood special education. She is a former director of early intervention, a senior Fulbright scholar, and a teacher of young children with physical and health impairments, social, emotional challenges, intellectual and learning disabilities. Patty has spent over four decades in the field of special education, undertaking research and teacher training in the United States and several other countries. After joining St. Anselm College with Dr. Joseph Bavaza last year, she was appointed as a senior research fellow volunteering to assist academic departments such as education and psychology and administrative areas such as the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Melia Center with guest lectures and consulting. Dr. Paul Finn is a licensed psychologist in New Hampshire with specific expertise in health psychology, neuropsychology, and general clinical practice. He has worked with clients throughout the developmental spectrum in addition, he has a subspecialty in sports psychology and has coached Division II sports, as well as taught and developed research in this area. Dr. Finn currently serves as faculty advisor for the Psy Chi Honor Society in Psychology, where he is a recipient of their National Faculty Award. He serves as director of the Sports Studies Interdisciplinary Minor and is currently, once again, the chair of the psychology department. Dr. Finn regularly mentors students as part of the IDEA network of biomedical excellence, which we know here on campus as INBRI, which includes advising students full-time during the summer months and preparing students for presentation at regional and national conferences. Please join me in welcoming both Dr. Favaza and Dr. Finn. And I will now turn it over uh, for the first panelist, uh, Dr. Favaza. Dr. Favaza will speak first. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the idea uh, for this webinar came uh, because I received so many requests for an article I had written several years ago entitled Loss and Grief in Young Children. The article itself um, was based on experiences that my colleague, uh, Dr. Leslie Munson, and I had had as teachers of young children with and without disabilities, many of whom spoke of loss or demonstrated behaviors that signaled their grief as their world was changing in big and small ways. So in this uh, unique moment in our global community, as we are experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the work of Dr. Kubler-Ross and those who followed her, um, I think provide much food for thought as we adjust to our new normal. Kubler-Ross was a Swiss-American psychiatrist, researcher, and author of the best-selling book on death and dying, where she first discussed her theories on stages of grief. And while she believed these experiences to be universal, she, of course, recognized the individual variation 
in a loss experience. And in fact, since then, many theorists and researchers have applied uh, those stages to the transitions that people experience throughout their lifespan. So let me see if I can share my screen. Um, so here's an example of um, two of those uh, ideas of a conceptualization of loss and grief. And what I think you see, if you look especially at the highlighted blue words, uh, both of these conceptualizations are broad in scope and they have particular relevance to our lives today during a pandemic. Most everyday experiences have been upended. I don't need to tell you that. Um, it's left all of us um, to adjust to the new normal of social distancing, face masks, hand washing, Zooming, just to name a few things. How do we process that sense of loss associated with so many aspects of everyday life? Many would say, and I've uh, done several readings recently about this collective sense of grief uh, that we are feeling not only in our own community here, but also in our nation and in a global context. Uh, most importantly though, it's an individual experience. So how do we support children as they make this major, major pivot in their lives? I think it is a topic that is worth careful thought and action as we recognize that all significant transitions have a potential loss component. And thus, each one of those events actually could be viewed as a dress rehearsal for the next loss, the next transitional moment in their lives. And so if we as parents, caregivers, and teachers can foster healthy ways for children to come to terms to process um, their current losses, it will likely improve their capacity to respond to subsequent transitions and losses in healthy ways. As noted at the bottom of this slide, there are many types of loss, and I suspect um, you are familiar with many, if not all of these. Uh, typical loss events include professional and personal changes, such as uh, you've lost your job, you're relocating, you're changing uh, schools, you've uh, changed your friendship groups, uh, divorce, miscarriage, and of course, death of a loved one. But even happy events can be accompanied with a sense of loss. As one person steps into a new chapter, they perhaps are letting go of some aspects of their previous chapter or previous life. This could include marriage, birth, adoption, graduation from high school or college, or even becoming a priest or brother as experienced by our beloved members of the monastic community. There's also a third type of loss, one that we would term as unexpected or sometimes use the word non-events, unexpected events or non-events. These would include transitional moments or events that did not, a person did not get to experience or they experienced it in an unexpected or different way. All you have to do is think about this past semester and that should bring that to mind or graduation, graduation celebrations, whether that's from eighth grade or 12th grade or college something that was anticipated but did not happen or did not happen in the way that was expected. It could even include having um, marrying or, or having children in a way that was not anticipated, having a child with a disability who does not experience a traditional coming of age milestone at the same time or in the same way or at all. What is notable about all of these losses is that each of them has a potential to shift one's identity, sense of security, and relationships. And while loss experiences can lead one on an incredible, albeit painful, personal growth journey, or newfound purpose, or newfound direction in life, it can be challenging as well, of course. So I'm gonna take a brief uh, look at, um, if I can change the page, let's see, uh, at the next slide. 
uh, knowing uh, the brevity of time we have, Paul and I were talking, we're chatting about something that sometimes is covered in one or two semesters courses. Um, so I'll do my best to take us a quick walk through this. These represent the stages uh, that Kubler-Ross uh, put forward and that have been um, now utilized to, for us to think about when we look at many transitions children face. Um, Denial can look like temporary shock. Oh my goodness, I can't believe what's happening. It could also look like uh, someone is ignoring the event or the situation, refusing to talk about it or to uh, think about it. So for example, uh, I would see children that uh, plugged in intensely into playing and could not let go of their imaginary moments and suspend that because what we were dealing with in the present was might be just too difficult. Or I overheard two children talking the other day, one wanting to talk about this event we're going through and the child next to them said, change the channel. I don't wanna talk about it. Um, the right hand column I think is particularly useful. I found this useful as a teacher and as a mom because I would look at this and scratch my head and say, what is the purpose of each of these? Um, and it helped me anyway to see that there can be some function or potential benefit for each of these stages. So for example, denial can be viewed as an initial protective response, helping minimize the overwhelming pain or shock uh, to understand what's happening. Anger, we don't need to describe what that looks like. I think we all know what lashing out in words and action looks like and feels like. But examples I've heard recently from colleagues and about their children were all about the famous meltdowns that happened when children had to uh, do school at home. And one parent the other day said to me, I have a four-year-old, seven-year-old, and eight-year-old. Uh, the day I announced the first day of summer, they all burst into tears because we had already told them with previous meltdowns that one would not have little league, one would not go to t-ball, one was not going to his first experience at sleepaway camp. And the trip to Disney, which they had prepared for for two years and talked about with great excitement, was off the table. You can only imagine the anger and the meltdowns that ensued. I think a function of anger is an emotional outlet, especially when faced with so much disappointment to process. Some even say that anger represents an outward emotion, perhaps sometimes masking an inward emotion of fear. Bargaining uh, may look like making personal requests to a higher power or promises to self to minimize or manage pain. So a mom said to me recently when she listened to her child's prayers, her child said, oh God, please let Papa live and I will never talk back to mama again. Um, another uh, parent relayed to me that uh, she had a week's worth of her child cleaning her bedroom and her child confided in her that I am trying to do better uh, at my chores around the house this week so that we can go to school next week. Both of these would be classic examples of bargaining and they can be beneficial uh, because they can lead to self-reflection perceived sense of control, and even a break from maybe panic of feeling calm and at peace uh, by uh, doing that kind of stage of bargaining. Depression, we probably all know what this looks like, this deep sadness that may interrupt eating, sleeping, ability to concentrate, even our socialization uh, patterns may be impacted by this. So two parents, different parents told me recently one of their children was crying more every day and for long periods of time. Or another one, her daughter said to her, mommy, it's hard to be happy today, just like yesterday. Depression can be uh, the result, can result in being more present to the pain that's happening in one's life as perhaps panic begins to subside a little bit. And of course, we all know it can lead to a tendency to retreat or uh, in order to process the actual event. Acceptance, it sounds like a happy place, but uh, that everything's all right, but it, that's actually a bit misleading because sadness and regret could still be there. But what is not notable about this particular moment is that 
perhaps the person is no longer resisting the new reality. So I was talking to some college age students. I was also talking to middle schoolers and uh, high school students. And I heard a kind of recurring theme. Uh, they would say, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm making the best of it. I'm making peace with it. It's still sad, but I am. And they filled in the blank of different things that they were doing to deal with uh, moving forward. Acceptance can help one mobilize, organize themselves to the new normal, take steps to put things in order, perhaps sometimes reframing the experience or one's purpose uh, in life. I think perhaps, um, so that's really fast, I know, and a lot, uh, so my apologies. Um, but uh, I hope what we take away from the uh, stages of loss and grief are these four points. Um, these caveats are important. It, that grief experience is very unique to each person, influenced by so many variables. All you have to do is look at your own home culture or a larger uh, community, uh, the culture of your community, and look at how is grief, what are acceptable ways to express grief within uh, that home setting? What are communication patterns and language that is used to talk about things? Or do we not talk about things? Um, so it's idiosyncratic. It is a nonlinear sequential process. So it's very messy. That's the bottom line from uh, the bullet point number two because it can, uh, those stages can reoccur. And all we have to do is think of words such as trigger. Even my own children in their early 20s have talked about uh, triggers that this has brought up, previous losses and experiences of grief that they have had. But the most important thing on this uh, slide is the last one. Hope is a critical aspect in every stage um, of this process. Hope is, uh, makes uh, an unbearable situation a little better. Why? I think because it has the ability to sustain us. Uh, research has shown that uh, hope helps us manage stress and anxiety. It contributes to well being uh, and it can even motivate us into action. So, a common phrase we would use with uh, children and even the families we work with uh, was something like this this news or this situation is sad, but you are strong and we will get through this together. That one sentence uh, was used over and over again as our mantra because it validated what was happening. It affirmed the resiliency and strength in the child or the family. And it sent a message that was hopeful and also a message that they are not alone in what uh, they are dealing with. Uh, so that in itself provided, I think, comfort and security uh, as well. So um, when we look at loss and grief in children and all those stages, the left-hand column, uh, I think, is a very simplistic way for help, help us understand that children are um, really having three responses sometimes simultaneously or three manifestations of loss and grief and we've just given examples of emotional outbursts or behavioral responses uh, but the cognitive one we i didn't chat about and i'll just say that uh, it's really important to understand that they have a cognitive response that is actually occurring through a developmental lens and so there was a handout uh, put out there as a pre-read, which um, is an excellent resource, and there are many more out there, of helping a parent kind of look at the age of a child or their developmental level uh, and understand how are they thinking about the event or a concept such as death, okay? Uh, but the right-hand column is where I get pretty excited. These are the tasks that children are working on. And uh, I, we've used these over and over again. I did as a teacher and also as a parent, because if I understood their task, then it helped me to know what is my job here in supporting um, uh, this child uh, through this process? So during the task of understanding a child uh, or adolescent obviously is seeking to determine 
what caused the loss, why did it happen? Um, and so this implies having developmentally appropriate conversations about what happened and why, but it's important to remember that this conversation is a repeated conversation. Uh, as a child processes that one conversation, they are probably coming back many, many times to have the same conversation or have more or different questions. And especially when you think of a child developing and increasing cognitive capacity or the passage of time and now they've had time to think about it, uh, it'll be a reoccurring conversation. Grieving, that of course is the task um, that allows children and adolescents to experience the painful feelings associated with what they consider they've lost. This is where self-expression and all the ways that we can allow children to uh, grieve is so important, whether that's through art or movement or writing or reading or talking, uh, whatever that self-expression is, and of course, in a healthy uh, way. Um, one side example I can give you of that, um, as some of you may know, we have children and some of them are adopted and they used to play what they called orphanage. Um, and one day I was walking past the bedroom uh, and they were playing orphanage uh, and it was what they called the goodbye day. Uh, and they had lined up all stuffed animals and um, whatever action figures and dolls from the house. Uh, and reenacting that uh, saying goodbye, uh, they were grieving. They were grieving through play. Um, and so there are all kinds of ways that children express that. And also in this moment, you may see children needing something uh, that they've already um, uh, let go of, such as being uh, rocked uh, at nap time or night time. And so even as um, a teacher, we would uh, sometimes uh, go back, fall back on routines that children showed us that they benefited from as they were grieving. Commemorating one of my most favorite tasks that children work on is really allowing children uh, to, uh, to develop personally meaningful ways to affirm and remember the event or the person. Just three quick examples that were given to me during this pandemic. One family talked about planting trees and perennials, uh, that they uh, had a ceremony out there, that they shared words of what it meant to them, and they looked forward to the changing of the seasons and when the uh, blossoms would come on again in the spring so they could revisit and re-talk about uh, the event. Another family created a time capsule and they put in there with their children what I loved about my life before and after the pandemic. I thought this was exceptional because even the after part, uh, the things, examples they gave were I love spending time with my mom and dad. Uh, I love it when we take hikes and cooking together. And so really helping them see uh, a positive narrative can be had in this moment as well. One more, a family had to move from their home to their grandparents' home to make sure they were safe and well. And the family talked about uh, taking their children around room to room in their house they were saying goodbye to. Memories were told in each room, they kissed the walls in each room and have one last game of hide and seek with all the family uh, there uh, with peals of laughter as they said goodbye. I call that letting go well. Um, uh, from my perspective. Uh, obviously, you can commemorate uh, many uh, do acts of kindness for first responders and victims of the pandemic as well. Moving forward during this test, uh, children discover new ways of going on while maintaining, I think, a connection and a representation of the event uh, that shaped their lives. Uh, so oftentimes with uh, children, what we would do is come out with next steps, life has changed, let's rethink how we do things, and then even uh, further to-do lists that go with those, and depending on children's uh, developmental level, uh, how much they can participate in that. Another group of family, uh, families that I work with came up with, they, they wanted to recognize that children, even when they are moving on or still having moments of grief, so they came up with the, um, you know, what they called uh, uh, the sad and worried chart. Uh, and basically it's the children were able to say or put pictures up there, what are they sad about? And then the other side was, 
what can you do when you're sad? And so uh, using visual supports, uh, photos, pictures, and choices that children had that would help them make them feel better. It really taught them that uh, you have this problem and then you have possible solutions too. So that was a lovely way of helping them uh, move on. Um, I think the most wonderful thing is there are so much out there that you can do to support uh, children, even uh, those who uh, obviously grieve in very different ways. Uh, and these are just a few of my thoughts on that. I think one of the first things uh, is really, really important is that uh, you need to know yourself. How do you, uh, as a caregiver, parent, teacher, handle loss and grief? What are your strengths and limitations in this? Knowing we're all lifelong learners, uh, if I feel like I need to go out and get a resource, I try and do that um, because I'm recognizing that I'm modeling and mentoring uh, this process uh, for and with children. The other kind of piece of knowing yourself is it implies taking time for yourself um, as you also have your own needs uh, in this uh, moment. Uh, remember the caveats but the, uh, about grief process, but the most important one is hope. That mantra, we are resilient, we will get through this together. Um, you know, while you're doing that, I don't think we have to tell any of us as adults how important routines are for young children. Uh, consistent routines are critical, but at this moment with a lot of flexibility, as we pay close attention, observe and gently respond to the changes in children around us. Of course, being more available and responsive and listening while resisting to rush in to fix it. Seeking professional support uh, when disabling grief is evident. So if a child is staying too long socially isolated, too long in anger, not being able to turn their behavior outbursts around uh, and be comforted, um, I would be the first to pick up the phone uh, and try and find professional help. Um, and there are many institutions, including St. Anselm, but also school districts and professional organizations that have uh, resources out there. The last one I just want to highlight is obviously when you re uh, use resources, they should match a child. We used to call this goodness of fit. Uh, so a list was uh, provided of all kinds of resources, uh, some of them representing uh, resources for children some for adults, some for families of children with disabilities. Um, there were two other uh, uh, reflection resources added in the overview handout. Uh, one, a narrative called Welcome to Holland, and the other, uh, a nice inclusio to the packet, was uh, some quotes by uh, Dr. Kubler-Ross. Uh, for those of you who like to uh, self-reflect, uh, I think those two uh, handouts will be particularly helpful. And before I pass it off to um, Professor Finn, I just want to close on a, um, a note of hope. You know, children and we, the community who raised them, are resilient. Um, we will grow in our resiliency, becoming perhaps closer to one another, more sensitive and more compassionate. Uh, parents have talked to me about finally, finally unplugging with their children um, and all the activities that they've been doing. All of those things will make us stronger and closer. So I encourage all of us uh, to do leave taking well. I think it will serve you and the children, our children well for years to come. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to pass it off to um, Professor Finn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. This is the first time I do this webinar format, having been on sabbatical. I am um, going to be doing such things, I'm sure, in the fall. It, it is not a joyful experience, I must tell you. I'd much rather do it in person. Looking at myself while I talk is not a pleasure I have whatsoever, but let's go. Um, it's been a pleasure talking and working with Patty over this because it gave me the opportunity to take a look at my own sense of grief and what that means. On the handouts, there is the, a, a table of developmental responses to loss. And as I'm presenting kind of a, a clinical end on this, 
that's a wonderful handout um, that, for example, if you have a two to four year old child, this is what you might see in terms of grief, possible signs, and some responses you might give. But also knowing that um, as adults, it's not that we don't have the feelings of the two to four year old, we get it all, we get the whole thing. By the way, at the end of this today, we're all gonna be gathering, and you're certainly welcome to come if you're in the area, we're gonna be going to Fratello's for lunch. You might be kind of thinking I'm crazy. That, that, that's a whole other issue. Um, there is no Fratello's for lunch. That's gone. This is the closest we're gonna get. After this, the green screen behind me is still there. I'm going to go have soup with my wife here at home, but it's different. They say we're going into a new time. Yeah, but it's important to grieve the time that has gone by. Um, regarding our children, if there's a, a physical loss, and there have been over 100,000 now, with a physical loss, um, I would suggest you get help, everything that Patty mentioned. And in addition, if a child has a trauma history or uh, a very negative relationship with the person who passed where they might feel, I willed them dead or other such things, it, it may not be bad to at least get a consult for yourself and what the best response might be for that. Um, and that's not to be taken lightly because um, you know I'm not actually sitting in the dining hall because uh, this is not where I usually sit. But this is what I feel like, this is what I'm feeling like today. Okay. As I'm sitting here talking with you, it broke already. <laughs> This is the new normal. It can very much feel like here I am in prison um, and I've got to be masked. And if I go out of the house and I touch my mouth, I could die. Okay. I never had that feeling before. I, I need to get out of this background. It's kind of creepy. But now, we're in a stage of parenting our children and in parenting our children from the background of our own grief and loss, it's difficult. Um, but I remind you something that was a note textbook, um, never saw it at a conference. It's something my mother said. She says, understand that in raising your children, you're never going to get it fully right. And if you feel like you're struggling to get it right, that means you're in the game and that's what's right, to be there and be the game with them. Um, that parent element is, is incredibly important. And as Patty mentioned, um, the, the, the types of losses that occur, we're experiencing some already. It's a different environment. Um, the relationships are different. Um, I get to hug my wife, thankfully, thank God. Nobody else. It's been a while. And so it's not just one loss. We're having combinations of loss. I've got a very dear friend who was my secretary for many years in private practice. Who was my secretary when I came to town to work at Elliott Hospital. She's got COVID. She's in the nursing home. Um, and it's not okay for us to even go wave in the window because of where she's located. Now we're going to take all these feelings and we're going to talk with our children. So understand that it's, it, it is that relationship. It's very important. And as long as your head's in the game and you're struggling to try to get it right, it's not a big mistake. I'm going to give you a couple tips as, perhaps as we go along with that. Patty mentioned understanding, grieving, commemorating, and mourning. In the commemoration, it, it, that's kind of an active stage. And for me, probably because I've taught humanistic psychology a number of times, um, love is not a noun, it's a verb, it's action. It's action oriented. And especially with children, when there's, when there's a loss, it's important at some point to be able to do something. One 
is to share the silence. And given that 89 participants here, I'm gonna guess, majority of you graduated from St. A's, you have some understanding um, in faith. And if, if there is a faith, I used to spend time with, my, uh, with our children where doing prayer at night, they could say whatever they wanted and it was sort of all the all in for you. We wouldn't hold them accountable to what they were saying to Jesus. But that gave us many great insights on how we were doing as parents. And occasionally, they would certainly hear our prayers as well. And psychologically, you're talking to a third party. And that can have a lot of value to let you know how you're doing. It also lets you know how they're communicating um, and the level that they're communicating at. And by level, I'm, I mean this. When my son was young, we were in the car riding, and he used to say, Dad, the moon's following us. And I was about to break into a lovely lecture on the science of perceptual illusions. And then I realized he was too young for that. And we pulled the car over, got out of the car, said, you run that way, I'll run this way, and we did. And he jumped and was very proud to know the moon followed him. How cool is that? In time, he came to learn that the moon doesn't follow, that that's an illusion. But it wasn't his time. And learning the time, again, I'm going to refer you back to that uh, developmental response to loss uh, hand up is, is particularly important. Also, uh, particularly for first responders, um, Professor Brady in the psychology department has run a frontline resilience peer support group for folks. And it, it, it's hard to say, I want to get peer support when the war is going on. But that's a really valuable time to be able to do that. It's to work with ourselves with our kids. Now, children, Part of growing up, we teach them um, culture, we teach them tradition. In my family, the tradition was when somebody died, you'd, you'd have a funeral service, you'd gather together, you'd share your loss, your sadness, and afterwards, you go to Belmont Hall here in Manchester and you'd have a brunch. Um, but that's gone. I, and there's a need to develop other traditions in advance with, with your children, almost kind of in anticipation uh, for when things do happen, that you have your ability to put, put out the fires, if you would. So the quiet time with them, uh, and, and again, for us, it used to be a campfire, whatever it is, gives them a chance to talk and gives you a chance to listen with your heart. Okay. Um, this is uh, perhaps where our children are, or certainly would like to be. That has a powerful effect has an effect with the kids, has an effect on me, so I'm gonna go back to the library where I belong. Um, not to tussle with their friends, to hug their friends, to roll in the dirt is a huge loss. Um, and I know, as I, I know many of you alum, that you're doing that with your, with your kids. Uh, I was looking at a video with one alum with her lovely redheaded kids um, out playing and running around and the dad out there who managed to have some kind of a golf cart. Um, by the way, dad, get out of the golf cart. <laughs> and they're, they're chasing that cart around. We have to do that with them and we have to do that for. Um, here's a couple very brief examples and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking. We were running a summer camp at the college and this little gal who just came for a couple of days, man, did she love to run, she's going all over the place. This one day she came and she was sitting quietly with her head down. As I uh, went and sat next to her and, and asked her, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because the redhead's actually watching and just texted to me, nice shout out. Um, we'll get you later. This little girl, um, when I asked what's going on, 
She says, I don't know if I should talk about it. And I said, that's okay, you don't have to talk about it. Anyway, we can help you get back and play. She said, I'm worried about my dad. And I said, wow, is your dad okay? She said, my grandmother died yesterday. And my dad told me I have to come to camp and I want to be with him. And I said, I said I'm sorry for your loss with your grandmother. Uh, did your grandmother like anything she was doing in particular? She said, yeah, she would come to my little cross country meets in junior high. And I said, great, so she liked that. She said, yes, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll talk to your dad when he comes to pick you up this afternoon. Because frankly, I wanted him to understand that she was misinterpreting. Um, and maybe today you can run for your grandmother. You can honor her with your run. And she jumped up, took off running. It's that wonderful expression of love in action. And, and, and that becomes particularly important. The other one's kind of, kind of personal. Um, it was a person I knew very well, older than me. He was mentoring me in an area. Not sports, don't try to guess. Um, and um, he died abruptly. It was a very, very tragic death. About a year goes by, and this young gal, different name, uh, came to me. And the school referred her because she was um, not making friends, grades weren't doing well, and, and things had just reversed on her. And um, very unfortunate. And while she's talking with me, I realized, my God, I know the loss she's talking about. That was my friend. That was her family and it was my friend. When I'm sitting there, a tear rolled down my cheek. Therapists aren't supposed to do that, so I knew I was in deep trouble. Um, and I said to her, I'm gonna finish the evaluation, I'm gonna to talk to a friend of mine, and let's see, we're gonna meet one more time, let's see what we can do. And I immediately called my friend, I said, dude, I'm not supposed to be crying in therapy. This is what's happening, blah, blah, blah. And he said, look, I'll work with you, you see her again, and, um, but I think you can do it. Great. I got a phone call about four days later from the school saying, oh, Dr. Finn, you're amazing. She's doing great. I didn't quite get that, but she came back and, and, and it turned out that seeing an, an adult cry, a tear, validated the person for her, it gave it meaning. And it was relational. And I said, did you know I knew this person? She goes, yeah, that's right, I came to see you. Okay, that was a heck of a setup. Um, but uh, very, very powerful uh, relationally. And what you want to do as you're understanding and working with your kids is to know that number one is you, as Patty says, Take care of yourself. There, there's so many feelings we have yet to have with this whole pandemic thing. Number two, um, listen with your heart to your child. And three, know it's relational. And um, getting help is important, but it's really sad because if I had a young child now and I felt, my God, my kid's not adjusting. And, and I had a family say, I don't know why we're seeing you. Everything is fine. The family's great. Everything's wonderful. And I was kind of stumped and I said, do you have a dog? And they said, yeah. I said, how's the dog doing? I don't get it. The dog's peeing on the rug. Dog never did that before. Well, there's significant changes in the house such that the dog couldn't take it. Okay. And so I knew there were problems at home based on what, what the pet was doing. Um, I guess the um, Patty talks about hope. And with hope comes purpose. You, you need to have a purpose and, and you need to drive that purpose. The quiet time is important. And there is a time for the moon to follow the child. And if you walked outside and looked at the moon, you could let it follow you again if you just give up for a moment. And there's a time to learn about the moon. There's some really good sites out there on talking about COVID to your child. But if you look at one, look at at least five and um, be careful because there's some sites that I was looking at that aren't particularly helpful. 
So with that, thank you for um, coming to the webinar. I'm getting really tired of looking at myself, but glad to know that you're out there. So let me turn it back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Finn. And thank you, Dr. Favaza, for those two excellent uh, presentations. And uh, Dr. Finn had forewarned the panelists that he was going to use some dry humor. And so I hope you picked up on that uh, early on with the reference to Fratello's. And then you got the visual clue with the, with the masquerading backgrounds uh, shifting behind him uh, periodically. So uh, thank you, uh, both of you. And uh, since I have uh, probably the least parenting experience of anyone uh, participating today, I'm glad that some people have submitted questions. Uh, so you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. You can just type in a question there. And we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, to go through them. And so I'll read them out. And I, I think for all the questions submitted so far that uh, either or both uh, Dr. Favaza and Dr. Finn can, can chime in. And I will let you uh, figure out who goes first, unless you prefer for me to, to assign them. But uh, Dr. Favaza and Dr. Finn, thank you for doing today's webinar. Curious if you have any advice for high school student athletes who have missed out on their high school spring seasons and club seasons. Dr. Finn? Um, boy, that's very difficult to um, have to stay active, have to stay physically engaged and involved. I know I put a couple eye hooks on trees outside and I'm using heavy therapeutic bands to do some of my exercises. And um, using this resource is impersonal, but if I were coaching now, I would be running check-ins with them to look at what they're doing. We would have them contact each other. Um, they re we'd set up probably teams of uh, older and younger to cross check with each other on what they're doing. And depending upon the resources, even go so far as to um, have them pick a partner to exercise with virtually. They can have some fun with that. It's not the same thing, but it's important to be able to um, have that connection with each other because sports, is very much about friendships, relationships, and that, that can't be underestimated. Dr. Favaza, do you have anything to add? No, I, I think uh, the points that, um, that Paul put forth are probably similar to what I would say. So important to stay active, engaged, wonderful to, if you can connect in a relationship with somebody that, um, you know, is, in the same, um, you know, does the same sporting activity. Yep. Uh, knowing that this pandemic and the loss associated with it will continue for the foreseeable future and may peak again, any suggestions for how parents and caregivers can continue to offer support long-term? Dr. Favaza? Um, well, I think uh, one thing is paying attention to what's working now or uh, successful or effective with your own children, keeping them talking or engaged um, so that your communication and relationship is strong, um, not only now, but long term. Um, one of the things I found in doing uh, grief work with families long term was having support groups, virtual support groups, where we talk about comp shared problems that we have and shared problem solving uh, also is a strategy uh, I would uh, strongly recommend. Um, you know, this is not going to go away, uh, actually. Uh, they're going to experience many losses uh, in life, and I think it's reality. Uh, we don't have to frame that way for children, but I think following uh, strategies that you found effective um, and being sensitive to when they need new ones. Um, as you all know, you could try something and it works for you for a while and then no longer. Um, and so being sensitive about that as well. Dr. Finn? Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted with a question that popped up on the webinar chat, not on the Q&A. So brother, if you, you don't mind taking a quick peek at that. Sure. Um, I did. Looking at the data uh, and looking at the fact that Brazil's going into winter and we're seeing an incredible rise in cases uh, for the predictable future, there's not going to be a normal. 
and we need to take care of our own health care and do things we might not have done before. It may sound crazy. Yesterday, my wife in the car got in the car to go out and eat at a restaurant. We, didn't, we knew there was no restaurant. We just drove for a while. And we came back and that, that was kind of nice. But you need to take those times and the moments. And one thing I failed to mention is you need to have a schedule. Um, and the kids need to have a schedule that they know what's going to be anticipated so that that can build into your week. It's not okay to become so um, kind of diluted that you're asking yourself, is today Tuesday? Is tomorrow? What day is it today? Have a schedule. Um, and do fun things within your ability to do them. Thanks. The uh, next question, with some kiddos being so little through this, do you think it'll be hard and sad for them to transition back to what is, quote, normal life when the pandemic is over? Dr. Pavaza? I think the short answer to that is absolutely. Um, you know, that's a major change. They've had a uh, home around them all this time. Uh, and I'm just remembering first days of kindergarten or first day of whatever, uh, of leave taking from home uh, for children at, at every age, uh, even uh, high school and even going off to college. Of course, it's going to be difficult. Um, you know, and so I think you knowing that, uh, you know, can prepare yourself um, and your children for that. Um, you know, um, I just, um, you know, and having pleasurable things, I'll, I'll um, um, go off of uh, something that Paul just said. Uh, when I, uh, pleasurable things to do uh, that ease the pain of that moment, even for the parents, um, even for the children. Um, so I'm remembering first times of sending our children back into the world again after they'd been substantially isolated in our own house, not because of a pandemic, but because summertime or because we had moved or um, it's gonna be an adjustment just like it is uh, for those uh, types of transition. And I think critical that, uh, again, what did you learn from this one? What are things that are still effective? Um, for children and uh, paying close attention to that, not only for them, but I think also for the parents. Dr. Finn, uh, here, I think this is the question you were referring to earlier from the, the chat feature. So if I could ask the participants, uh, people attending, if they you can use the Q&A, just one last thing for me to, to, to check as we're going through the questions, but here's the question uh, from the chat. So uh, Dr. Paul Finn's comment on children who have trauma history, especially those children whose trauma may be associated with a person who has recently died was a wonderful point. Any advice or further detail for clinicians to provide support and aid to these children by telehealth? I think I'll, uh, and, and looking at that, it, it's very difficult for a parent to refer their child to a specialist and have the child stay home and talk to a computer. Telehealth has many absolutely wonderful advantages, but it's difficult relationally. Um, and I know the person who asked the question, and I know she does telehealth, and I'm very, very proud of what she's doing. Um, unless the situation does not allow, um, I would engage the parents and the child initially in the telehealth experience, and probably meet with the parents briefly to talk with them about what they can do um, after the session and before the next session. Um, many, much of it can be educational for the parent um, who will have to, it's, it's the old thing of teach me to fish. Um, it, it's a very difficult situation doing telehealth, especially for the clinician and uh, for clinicians who care about working with people to do it all on the computer will wear down over time unless they're taking care of themselves. Thank you. The um, next question. I have an almost 10 year old who struggles with anxiety at baseline. This summer would have been his first summer going to sleepaway camp as well as to start having sleepovers with friends. 
he is definitely finding it hard to navigate friendships at this time, and we're not sure how to keep giving him opportunities for growth in independence and friendship. Any ideas as how to do this in this strange time? Dr. Favazza, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, that's a um, challenge, uh, and I've heard this from several uh, parents, uh, colleagues of mine with children that age. You know, they've set up virtual ways for children to connect, just like all of us have. Uh, they have play dates virtually, um, as one example. Um, you know, they have um, really tried to. Um, I think some of them set up pen pals. Um, they some of them bend the rules in their house about how much screen time because of all of this. Uh, recognizing that something has to give here. Obviously, if anxiety is um, at a um, uh, part of that child's um, characteristics, those need to be carefully attuned to. Um, I'm working with a parent right now who a lot of things recently have triggered uh, their anxiety um, and anxiousness. And so really trying to find calming ways, uh, tried and true ones that perhaps work with that child, but also uh, new things that they could try in this moment. Um, this particular parent uh, reached out and was able to connect their child to another child uh, and um, their common ground. And they knew the um, therapists who work with them and both parents um, so they could share their common ground and their struggles that they have uh, with one another. Um, you know, I think uh, Paul said this earlier, but it's so important relationships for all of us, but especially children and feeling isolated in this moment. So, um, you know, I, I think looking for ways to do that. Uh, I'll give you one example too. People sat in bubbles. Uh, we were like uh, Professor Finn, we drove around just to see what's outside in the world as the leaves uh, started coming back on trees. And, um, stayed with our bubble of the people we live with, but it was so wonderful. We even did this once with some friends of ours that they were probably about 15 feet away from us uh, in their bubble. And just to be able to talk to them, uh, people that we knew or friends of our children, um, you know, was a huge thing. And doing that obviously by social distancing and there we were with our mask and some of us even had gloves. Uh, but even finding real-time ways to do that, that we felt all of us checked in and said we felt <laughs> safe about that. Um, so those are just things off the top of my head. Uh, Professor Finn may have other ideas as well. Yes, I, uh, I think it's really important that I was in the supermarket the other day and I had the mask on and the aisles are all marked one way. And a middle-aged fella came walking down the center of the aisle the wrong way with no mask on. And I felt anger. And I don't usually get angry like that. And I thought to myself, my God, Paul, what are you doing? And we have changed a lot in this regard, such that we've had a couple people visit, but I interview them ahead of time to see are they at least doing it? We're very, very careful, okay? Are they doing what we're doing? And even when they visit, we don't give a hello hug and we keep distance and we do everything we're supposed to do. Now, for parents, you need to, you can't do Tarzan. You can't throw the kid at school in the fall. Um, you have to do it all pretty gradually. What are you comfortable with? Do you have a friend, does your child have a friend have you been talking with the parents? How comfortable are they? Can you have a, a distant visit, walk off in the woods someplace or a hike? How can you progressively step into trying to be normal, knowing indeed that it's not? And one more thing, please, people, beyond this whole topic, when folks are walking around and you're passing each other, if you can, say hi, because we can't be scary to each other all the time. Say hi, have a good day, how you doing? And I find so many people respond as if, oh my God, that's a human. And they say hi back. And we, we've got to keep that because the anxiety, the depression is strong. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a few questions left, but uh, you might have heard my grandfather clock just struck one. So we'll go uh, to a very last question and I will let uh, alumni events figure out how to uh, answer the remaining questions possibly on their website where you can find uh, the pre-reads as well. 
uh, that Dr. Vavaza mentioned earlier. But uh, so the last question, thank you for both speaking about this topic. I can honestly say I had not thought the impact of COVID-19 in terms of loss and grief. This makes so much sense. Going into the summer, how would you recommend students keep a routine and stay engaged when school will have ended and summer jobs won't likely happen? A great question. Um, I just want to uh, point, uh, remind people, as you did, um, that uh, one of the pages in the uh, pre-reads is a whole list of resources, and they are all live, active links. And I, I've gone like Paul. I, I actually went to every one of these. So lots of resources that are out there. Uh, to this specific question, I can tell you. Uh, uh, creating a uh, routine, a schedule, a schedule that's posted, uh, you know, that is a very good mix of a lot of fun, a lot of uh, togetherness and a relationship building. Um, or if you're into sports and opportunities to hone those skills, um, you know, I've talked to families who are organizing themselves uh, to have their own uh, day camp or their own uh, summer camp, summer sports camp at home and have gone out and purchased equipment and things like that. Um, so I just think uh, creating a routine uh, in your home that's both fun but also uh, very relational uh, is probably critical. Paul, you may wanna add uh, to that. Thank you. I think um, as we're going through the summer, it's okay to be in contact with whoever may be the teacher, ask if they would like to do Zoom with folks. It's also important to start thinking about because you can't, you, you, your child can't go to school and hug their friends and they're gonna have to sit a distance and so on, to start thinking of new, um, new traditions, uh, new pastimes that you can engage in, um, air hugs, air high fives. I'm, I'm not being that creative right now, but again, let's look at this as a graduated process going back to school. And as far as summer, I remember struggling ourselves when things were in that other world and, and very normal with what you do during the summertime. And so, um, God, that goes beyond my creativity and what you're going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll turn to the Benedictines and, and ask them to put, put all parents on a prayer list for the summertime because uh, sharing the creativity together, guys, is going to be important. Stay in touch with each other. So thank you uh, to both of you uh, very much. And that, that was very enlightening and, and new ways of thinking about some of these issues in, the, in this special strange uh, time that we're living in. So uh, to keep following uh, what's going on or maybe a little bit more material on this. So you, there's the, uh, the alumni webpage on the college website. There's the Anselm Hub, which lists all our activities that are taking place virtually uh, during the uh, during the COVID-19 era. And uh, so given we're doing this virtually, uh, the two panelists can't hear any applause from all the participants, but uh, all the attendees, but I assure you they're air high fives and air applause uh, for both uh, panelists. And uh, thank you for everyone uh, for, for joining us today. And I hope you join the college for other events uh, coming up shortly. Thank you.